So, who am I? Uh, my name is Chad Madcalf. I've, I've had three careers. One of them is, is uh, seven different startups. Uh, I was at Docker for six years. I'm very proud of that. Puppet, uh, there I was a big data. It was one of the first big data companies. Uh, Weepy Data was a fantastic company that left the biggest hole in the ground that I've ever seen. If you talk about a company that augers all the way in and fails hard. Uh, a couple of the others are uh, you know, smaller. But I started as a software, a software developer, uh, switched over to infrastructure, and built probably one of the last VC funded data uh, centers in, in the world. Uh, then went over to sales, and now I run strategy. Um, but I started my career as a biologist, as a molecular biologist, and I was staring at, I was staring at a seven year PhD program. Uh, and I went and visited, and everybody was miserable. And this was at Cal, so UC Berkeley, everybody was miserable, everybody hated it. They all said, it's gonna be terrible, our like, entire experience is awful, and when you get out of here, you're either gonna become a professor and live this life again, or you're going to work at h and Tech. Now, one thing that would have been cool is my entire research was around mRNA. So I would have been squarely centered in the COVID research. And so that would have been cool. But past that, it didn't seem cool at the time. So uh, I quit. I just said, I'm not going to go get a PhD. And I didn't really have a plan B. And a friend of mine got me an internship at a software company that turned out to be uh, really great. Because at the end of that internship, I was paying for rent in like laundry coins, because <laughs> I, had, I had no money, I was completely broke, and at the end of that internship, my boss said, hey, would you like a job? And I said, I, I don't have a degree in your field. And he's like, we'll pay for you to get a master's, don't worry about this, here's an offer. And I looked at it, and I was like, that's every, every month? And he's like, yeah, it's every month. I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> and it, it changed my life, it, it honestly did change my life, and I think that this is what that looked like at the time. So GitHub didn't exist. Git didn't exist, uh, so there was Linux. Uh, GCC is the sort of generic uh, compiler chain. I wrote a lot of C code. Uh, CVS was our version control system. This is like way back in the day, right? Uh, uh, the auto tools, and then uh, we didn't have to worry about, uh, we, had, we had our laptop where we would have office and all of that kind of junk, but because we worked in an office, you also get a big one the desktop that was a dedicated Linux box. You didn't have to worry about it. So, uh, and then there weren't really any IDs. You, they gave you a dot .file for Emacs or a dot .file for VI, and you were off the races, and everybody used the same thing, so it didn't really matter. There was 10 million lines of code. I was responsible for all the functionality you find in two header files. Like, that's it, that was my, my job. People were like, what about the dependencies? There were no dependencies. There was not, open source didn't exist the way that it works now. It's not like I go, I need a network library, I need to go find one. It's I need a network library, I need to go write one. So we wrote everything. We had everything in Trump in-house and from scratch. And so this is a great chart from a guy named Daniel Bryant who, who wrote his hardness over the length of his career. It turns out that ours, our timelines are, are wildly similar. So sort of in the 2000s, he had an architecture just like mine. It was a big monolith. Everything was built in house. He was responsible just for code, and he had a handful of tools. Then things got to be a little bit more complicated, and uh, you know, some CI started showing up. Was responsible for actually shipping the code and maybe some other bits. But this is kind of where we're at now, which is like shit got real hard, and, uh, it, and I am partly responsible for some of that because now you go into a job interview and it's like, okay, do you know Docker? Do you know Kubernetes? Do you know Amazon? Do you know this? 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 You know this? You <laughs> and you're just like, well, shit. And I think uh, it's great if you know those things over time, but maybe you don't need to know them right now. And it turns out, from the business perspective, they don't particularly, like you having to know all those things actually lines up in a way that's actually bad for the business. One, because you spend a lot of time doing it, and two, because having to know all of that makes you responsible for it as opposed to another team. So the term guardrails comes from Netflix, and Netflix was trying to do something different. They were way bigger than anybody else at the time. They were one of the largest consumers of Amazon, and they were breaking sort of traditional software models. And what they said is, 
uh, sort of the, this is a Jason Chandy who was head of security. In order to get the developers where we need them to go, we have to get out of their way. We have to stop doing these security reviews where we say, here's a hard gate. Um, if you can't get past this gate, you can't get to production. And so they said, well, how do we, how do, we do something else? And so he gave this talk at LASCON in 2013, which was called Gates, or Guardrails, Not Gates. And the idea was, are there systems that you can put in place that are automated where devs can't do something as opposed to make sure the devs don't do something? And so uh, you can free developers to go off and innovate as long as you keep them on the, on the rails. And so a couple of ways that you can think about this are things like code review is enforced. Things can't be committed unless there's a code review. Or libraries, we have to scan for approved OS licenses. Like, we have to know that what you're bringing in is MIT or Apache, or it's not counting because we don't, we don't play with any other licenses. Or uh, in the case of like Docker, you can only use images from trusted sources. So as somebody who is responsible for Docker Hub, there's a lot of garbage on Docker Hub. And lots of companies don't really want you to run that garbage. The fact that you run that garbage as root in production is probably not a good idea. So there is a world where you say, like, sure, if you want to use a Docker image, it's great. If you use it from our registry here, and then you can use anything you want so long as it's in our registry. That is a guardrail. Developers can do whatever they want so long as it's within the boundaries of some policy. And this is the path. This is a really, it's an eye chart. I don't expect you to read it, but what I want you to get a feel for is that a paved path takes you from somewhere all the way to the end. And I'll tell you about a company that I work with that has a magic, magic experience. So as a new developer, if you get tasked with writing a new piece of code, you log into a portal, who knows who you are, you hit a button, it gives you a list of templates. You say, I want a new Python app that's gonna go get deployed to Amazon ECS, it's gonna use this database. It will go create the GitHub repo for you. It'll populate that repo with a template that's effectively hello world with all the best practices all lined up for observability, for logging, for everything. <coughs> it will set up the CI process for you, it'll set up the CD process, and it'll deploy hello world to production for you so that you know in the end that whole thing worked. Then your responsibility is to change hello world to something else. Throughout that, security had their say on what they wanted, uh, Ops had their say on what they wanted, the logging folks, the observability folks, and nobody in this room probably cares because what we care about is just like, I just want to type the curly braces. Let me type the curly braces. <laughs> uh, but they get all of this for free just by following these paper paths. So it becomes really good for the developer. Also, as a new developer, you don't have to know those things. If you show up and the only thing you know is Python, because that's the only thing you, I hired you for, great. You can learn the rest of this crap over time, but let's just get you a world where you can type curly braces and ignore the rest. And so the number one thing I hear is like, well, that, that thing is, that sounds pretty awesome. What's that team look like? That team works for a company that has 5,000 engineers, 500 of which build this system, this magical, beautiful system that they call the developer experience. That's 10% of their engineering resources go to build this. Not everybody has that. Um, and so I think what you want to keep in your mind is, especially for small teams, lots of companies now have DevX teams or platform teams or uh, they might call it a DevOps team that can do some of this. Uh, or you might just be an individual app team that, that really doesn't have a huge choice. The way I look at it is, if you make an investment, then just make the decision that you're gonna do that because that is the biggest pain point that you're currently feeling. And so, uh, the way that that might look is something like this. So, this is an embedded system. Uh, to give you a feel for it, uh, what normally goes behind this little thing is two AA batteries. So this is an embedded computer from sort of the 2010-ish timeline that could run for two years on two AA batteries. And it would do things like uh, take temperatures. It was a sensor, basically a water sensor. Um, at that time, it was an open source project that was out of uh, UC Berkeley. And I was getting my master's. My company paid for me. They, they did actually follow through. They paid for me to go get a master's degree. I got paid 
paid to go to school half time and to work half time. It was awesome. And I part of my half time was I did research. Uh, and we, we built sensor networks with this. This required a very specialized tool chain, and nobody could do it. So most developers had, most of the students at the school <coughs> either had Macs or they had Windows boxes. They didn't really, they didn't really have the capability to run a, a, a Linux VM that was probably a little bit beyond where they were. The Linux lab at the university for both the grad students and the undergrads wouldn't let anybody install anything on those machines. Uh, and so we basically had this program where we had 30 students, grad students on top of that, so probably another 20 grad students, that you know, everybody was just fighting with the system. So what two of us did was we went out and made a live CD. So back in the day when you used to have live CDs and live USBs, you could take in a, you could take Ubuntu and shrink it down to fit onto a CD and then you could boot that CD. Or if you had a, a USB stick, you could boot off the stick and get persistence. And so what we did is we put all of the tool chain for this crazy compiler system onto that live CD, and then we gave those to all the students because they could go into the lab, pop open the CD drawer, hard restart that machine, which they, the, the operators didn't love, but I was like, you don't give me an option, so that's what we're gonna do. Uh, and then they would be fixed. And uh, it turned out that that actually spread throughout not only my university, but it spread out throughout the entire tiny OS community. And I got this, uh, I didn't even, this was on a mailing list, uh, but it was stop wasting your time installing and configuring tiny OS. It'll never be stable. Just use the VMware image, it's simple and stable. You don't have to worry about the configuration anymore. You're able to concentrate on your work. And there was two of us, and we spent two weekends doing it, and we probably freed up the time of probably a thousand students across sort of North America and, and a little bit outside of that. And that was a great return on investment for two weekends worth of work. And so I think <coughs> that's a it's a good way to say that there's probably lots of paid paths that are smaller that aren't the full end-to-end -end mutable system or guardrails. So it's you know it's relatively easy to say, hey, we're gonna do code review and you can't check in until we get there. So there's, these things do exist. But there is a balance because the alternative is your company might come in and, and do the opposite, which is like, this is the only thing you have. You have to do it this way. And we saw that, we saw that a lot in sort of the Docker timeline of like, you're gonna have to do it this way. And if it doesn't fit in the box, then their minds met, like just melt and then everything breaks. So the way that my recommendation is, you should find the balance, let people break glass, so that if, if it doesn't fit your paid path, let them go off the path. Just make sure that they understand that them going off the path is their responsibility. So I'll give you a great example. Uh, a company that remained nameless had a paid path that included automatic certificate rotation for TLS. And so once you accepted the paid path, you never had to worry about sort of your certificate for your web service uh, dying because you forgot to renew it. And uh, one group decided to go off the paid path, mostly because they were in the mindset of like, we're good enough, we don't need this. Um, and they had a multi-day outage that started because they had a TLS cert that expired. And then they had basically a cascading, cascading set of failures that occurred after that, where a service that was expecting that other service to be up then went down. When that went down, it corrupted data. That took out another service, and it actually wiped out one service, one TLS certificate wiped out their entire, um, the, the, the entire application service. And at the blameless force modem, the team lead had to, had to stand up and explain why they chose <coughs> not to be on the paid path. And they, they basically had to say, because we, we thought we were good enough to not be on the paid path. And that, that team had to eat that in front of everybody. Um, so I think as a developer who prides himself on being lazy, like I, if I don't have to worry about an entire class of problems, I'm pretty good to take your service. And I think what you'll find in lots of places is most people don't care where their Python comes from. Most people don't want to pay attention to TLS certs. Most people don't care about those things. So 
So um, don't make it. Uh, there's two ways to get started. Uh, if you have resources and you have a team, you should run it like a product. Like your your customer is the developer teams within your company. That way they have a say. They feel like they're not just getting a system hoisted upon them. In which case you run it like a product system. Now there's probably people in here that just don't have that. In which case plan B is like you fix the thing that sucks the worst and then you do it again. Uh, and you iterate over time and you make it, you will eventually make it better. Um, now, I will now jump in to say what Daytona is briefly because I feel like we solved this problem, we helped solve this problem really well. So Daytona provides one-click development environments for uh, our customers. So if you're familiar with things like GitHub Code Spaces, GitHub Code Spaces, you go to GitHub, you push a button, you get a Linux box with sort of everything that you need. Uh, that's great, we love Code Spaces, it's a, it's a SaaS multi-tenant solution. Most of our customers can't use SaaS. Most of our customers don't want to use multi-tenant. Uh, especially, you know, maybe not in Azure. Uh, maybe they want to allow these environments to see their staging environment, and the idea of like opening staging to all of Azure sounds like a bad idea, so they want to use Daytona. But really what you get is, this is an example where we set up a Go environment. Um, somebody in the company, We'll set this up. Usually, what my experience at Docker is about one in five developers, maybe one in 10, actually know how to write a Docker file. Those people are gonna write these same things, and then they're gonna make them available to everybody else, and nobody else is gonna have to care about it. Um, but <coughs> this one file will give you the environment with all the Go, uh, it's already installed for you, all the Go tools, it will wire up VS Code, so that you have all the extensions. Those extensions are all wired up for each of those tools so that you're using the right linters, you're using the right uh, formatters, you're using all of the best practices. If, you're, if your company lets you use Copilot or something similar, they'll wire that up. Uh, and at the, at the bottom, it'll also do things where like, when your environment starts, it'll start the application for you, it'll pop open the pretty preview window for you, uh, and all you have to do is click a button. Uh, and so we make that as a service, um, and we use Dev Container. Um, so you know, one thing you were talking about hackathons and whatnot. I think there is a world where you can have one of these files for your hackathons or for your boot camps, and then people can look inside them. Right? It's the best part about infrastructure as code. Like when I have time, I can go in there and figure it out. But right now, I don't have to. I just push this button. I get this thing and then I can focus on the program. So um, we think, if you remember the, the original one was, uh, the original tagline for a paid path was to give people an environment with, within boundaries. In this case, for dev container, dev containers have images, <coughs> which might be like Ubuntu. They have features, which might be like Go, or the AWS CLI, or you know, JQ which you can add on to those things. And then you have templates, which are a mix of those two things. And so within a company, much like sort of Docker images, these are basically just blocks. And you can give your developer a big box of blocks and say like, you can use whatever you want, so long as it's in this box of blocks. Um, and if you want another block, just tell us. And we can figure out a way to make it. Uh, but this is the way that we think that um, uh, we're gonna help one, companies, and then on the other side, uh, our tagline is uh, empower developers to focus on what matters, which is not where does the AWS CLI come from. <coughs> um, so I'm Chad. Uh, you can find me on Tuesdays at either Twitch or YouTube, where I generally stream about dev container or other things. I'm happy if you have questions. I'm happy to, to uh, answer some there. I'm also happy to chat with this after. Um, one of the things I like about living in San Francisco or in the Bay Area in general, I've worked in seven startups. I've never worried about the, I've never worried about the startups. Like a lot of folks uh, are like, well, aren't you worried that your startup is gonna go out of business? Like, I've had startups go out of business. Um, I've also gotten laid off. Uh, but 
because we had such, we have such a huge community, which is probably collaborative, and we almost always find a job relatively quickly because there's always a new startup, there's always a new thing. So I think, I do think that collaboration is probably a good thing because we'll have, I mean, we saw this, we see this, we're actually still seeing this now where, where people will get laid off and then within sort of the internal community of the world, you know, those people will get referred in through networks. Um, one of those challenges that you were, we were talking about at the beginning is that's actually also partly a challenge for making startups more diverse is my experience is when you're under pressure to deliver very quickly, you hire your friends because you have some amount of trust in that. And so you, it's, it's tough to go outside of that. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's it. Um, I will not prevent you from getting drinks, but you can find me after if you have questions.